others. So if they held a senior position um, and say it was a, the type of male psychopath that likes uh, seducing and, and discarding people, women, um, then they'll use that power and coercion to do exactly that. Make up a psychopath. So aggression, for example, um, delinquency, um, Machiavellianism, cunning. You think companies are rewarding those character traits by accident? Hitler was diagnosed as a psychopath in 1933, um, Goring in 1946 with the orbital frontal cortex, and then going down to the amygdala and the limbic system. And these these areas don't activate in psychopath. Research indicated to you in terms of the damage that's done. Well, in terms of the damage that's done it, by the presence of a corporate psychopath as, as in a leadership position, and the higher up they go, the more damage is done, by the way. I reckon that something like 70% of auditors have come across a corporate psychopath, you know, in the course of their duty. Other females are more attuned to psychopathic behaviour in the female managers. Dr. Clive Body, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Oh, you're welcome. Nice, nice to meet you. So, Clive, can you give us a um a very brief background of your story and how you became? I suppose you you would be considered now a world leading expert on corporate psychopathy. So, how did you uh, arrive at at that place? How do I arrive? <laughs> Well, I suppose I've been studying it for for the best part of 20 years now. Um, I originally worked with someone who had several of those traits. I wouldn't say they were a complete psychopath, but they certainly had some of the traits. And when I first read a, a tiny little piece in a Harvard Business Review called Executive Psychopaths, it sort of rang a bell. And at the same time as that, I was looking for something to research in my my doctorate, my first, my DBA that I was doing, uh, and the supervisors didn't want to research my initial topic because they weren't interested in marketing, which is what it was about. So I decided to do corporate psychopaths instead, which proved to be a good choice. Um, back then, uh, this was in 2005, approximately, uh, hardly anyone believed in corporate psychopaths because the the paradigmatic view of a psychopath was a sort of a semi psychotic violent antisocial man who uh and usually ended up in jail so the idea of the corporate psychopath somebody smooth and charming and sociable who gets on with everyone uh was was initially rejected uh, and for example I've, i found it very hard to get published in academic journals especially the the top ones because the editors would basically look at my title which had the words corporate psychopaths in it and then they'd send it straight back you know within 20 minutes uh, without really reading it properly well i suspect anyway uh, and it was only when one of the editors in chief of the Journal of Business Ethics uh, saw one of my presentations uh, that sh that I started to get published in in that journal, um, and she she herself said when she first saw the title she thought it was going to be some kind of nonsense, but as soon as she'd seen my presentation she asked me to send uh, to work it into a paper and, and send it into the journal. So that was kind of um, my lucky break in terms of getting published. And since then, I've published uh, about 50 papers, seven chapters, two books, and two doctorates, all on more or less the same thing. Um, how is an organization impacted by the presence of a toxic or a psychopathic personality? And particularly at a, at a leadership level, what have you, how, what have you, has your research indicated to you in terms of the damage that's done well in terms of the damage that's done it, by the presence of a corporate psychopath as, as in a leadership position and the higher up they go the more damage is done by the way mm. uh, for obvious reasons um 
it, it, it takes place at multi-levels simultaneously. So at the individual employee level, people are bullied and abused and sidelined and overworked. Um, and that has knock-on effects because people get demoralised. Um, they lose their pride in the job. Um, their well-being suffers, their mental health suffers. Uh, they start to withdraw from the organisation. So first it's small things like taking longer lunch breaks, arriving at work late, leaving early, and, and all the time trying to avoid interacting with this abusive psychopath who's, who's their boss. Um, and eventually they usually resign and leave. Um, and certainly in the in some of the case studies I've I've looked at and some of the qualitative research we've undertaken, there's a huge amount of staff turnover, uh, which starts relatively quickly and just continues. I mean, in in one case, in a company in London, a sort of national but fairly small company uh, or, or organisation, it was a not not for profit organisation. Um, everyone. Within three years, everyone had left, everyone being 100%. In fact, it was over 100% because the replacement staff also started to leave. So what that means for the organisation is there's no one there with any sufficient depth of experience of running the company to train the newcomers, and everything goes into decline. Um, and that's the sort of common story. Uh, that the that happens with a with a psychopathic leader. At the same time as that, they're giving glowing reports to their superiors and chairman of the board and and shareholders groups uh, about how brilliantly they're doing. And quite often that's um, manufactured and false. Um, so if you think of the case of Enron, for example, the three top guys were all independently. Uh, identified as having psychopathic traits or s some kind of psychopathic personality. Um, and they were telling people to buy the shares while they were offloading all of their own shares. And the, and the company eventually, as you know, collapsed in a heap because it had been fraudulent nearly all along. Um, and so the, the impact of that is filters out to society because uh, pensioners lose their, their pensions because th th that shareholding evaporates. Um, people in the jobs lose their jobs and their families become poor. Um, and the only people that usually walk away with any money are the psychopathic people themselves because they leave uh, with a golden parachute or they leave when the organisation is still doing well and they get the high salaries and bonuses associated with a falsely inflated view of uh, performance. So it's it's a negative all around. It's negative for individuals, it's negative for the organisation, and it's negative for society. They leave a trail of destruction in, in their wake. Um, why is there an over-indexing of people with psychopathic tendencies at the higher levels of an organisation? What character traits are fueling their rise and contributing to their rise in the organization? Uh, there are different views on why they want to get to the top. I think essentially they need, they seek power and control over other people and they like wealth and prestige. Um, it's arguable that they sort of try and fill a gap in their, a void in their uh makeup or their emotions because they have, don't have this emotional response and that means they don't have deep enduring relationships with with other people um and so to to fill that sort of emptiness inside them they seek power and money and the ability to manipulate people um so i suspect they're very strongly motivated by high salaries for the wealth that gives them and uh, they're motivated by the what they perceive to be the power that money gives them over others. So if they held a senior position um, and say it was a, the type of male psychopath that likes uh, seducing and, and discarding people, women, um, then they'll use that power and coercion 
to do exactly that. And there's a case study of that happening in um, in a book by John Clark that I that I read about psychopaths when I was first starting this this journey in 2005. Um, and uh, they bully and abuse and uh, yell and shout and hurt people. Um, I think there's two main reasons for that. One is it makes everyone in the organization scared of them. So nobody dare challenge their um, their decisions uh, because they know they'll get shouted at or yelled at or bullied to the point, often to the point of tears, this is. Um, and so they obviously most people would rather avoid that situation and they let the psychopathic leader do what he wants, which is usually uh, some sort of self-oriented uh, activity, which often doesn't co-align with the aims and objectives of the organisation itself. Uh, they're just looking after number one by, for example, giving themselves ever larger salaries um, and bonuses. And I think it also motivates their takeover um, um, activities. Uh, there's no, I've got no real evidence for this, but if a senior manager who's leading an organisation takes over another company, obviously it then becomes a much bigger company and he can say, look, I'm running a much bigger company and I, I deserve a much bigger salary. So it's that personal greed that can motivate uh, um, takeovers and acquisitions. Uh, and I remember reading some stuff in the Financial Times that most takeover and acquisitions don't fulfil the promises that um, the takeover firm makes when they're taking over the other firm. So that the expected uh, uh, economies of scale and things like that just, just don't event eventuate. Um, but despite knowing that, they they continue to do it. That's very interesting. So the, 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 the inference there is that these hostile takeovers, if you like, are motivated by personal greed and, and, and the desire for advancement. As well, opposed to I think in some cases, yeah, obviously mm. in all cases, but certainly in some. Because um, if you look at the graph of the way salaries have gone in the last uh, 50 years or so, I think the average CEO used to earn what was it, 36 times the average salary of, of his his or her employees, whereas now it's hundreds and hundreds of times. So the the it's gone out of all ratio and out of all proportion to uh, what they used to earn. And, of course, the higher that goes, the more it attracts the psychopathic because that's what, they're, they, that's what they want in life. Um, I mean, a management consultant once, once said to me, getting a job in... in as a CEO of one of these major companies, is now equivalent to winning the lottery because all of a sudden you've got a multi-million pound or dollar salary um, and it's arguably not worth that much because you're still doing the job that hundreds of other people could do if they had the same uh, opportunity. So it tends to be the most, ruth the most ruthless who get to the top because they want that power, control, and influence uh, that senior positions give them. And additionally, they don't have the emotional relationships which would draw them away from that. So they're quite capable of working 60 hours a week because they, they're, they're not bothered about going home to their family if they have one, and they're not bothered about um, seeing their sons and daughters because other people don't matter to them. What matters is their own... Uh, self enrichment. Do you think there's so, a? But apologies, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, it's okay. Come. On. So, um, do you think companies reward either knowingly or unknowingly the attributes that would make up a psychopath? So, aggression, for example, um, delinquency, um, Machiavellianism, cunning. Do you think companies are rewarding those character traits by accident or by design? I think quite often they reward these toxic leadership characters um, by accident because a abhorrent behaviour is is still relatively rare in the workplace. When we do come across it, we, we're not quite sure how to deal with it. 
and, and we quite often give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, so um, aggression gets looked at as being competitive, for example, um, and forgiven because if the person uh, looks like they're doing a great job, and quite often that is how they look, regardless of how their uh, subordinates view them, then they get away with it more because people are motivated by uh, the senior land managers are motivated by having what they think are good team members. And if, if those below them are uh, projecting this false halo of performance and achievement, um, then they overlook the more worrying signs uh, that, that they might be getting about things like harassment and sexual harassment and uh, driving people and bullying people um, in the workplace. What's your perspective? I've heard you talk about this before, but I just want to touch on it again in terms of screening for disorder or, or, or behavioral traits that we, we don't want to see. What's your perspective? Well, personally, I think at the most senior levels of organizational appointment and, and political appointment, we should be screening for psychopathic personalities because uh, I remember reading a paper very early on saying that a psychopathic political leader would would have no hesitation in nu using nuclear weapons, for example, even if the situation didn't call for that use, uh, if it ever does, um, uh, because they don't care about other people. So there's no there'd be no guilt or feeling of regret or shame about doing that kind of thing. Uh, and therefore, it's dangerous to have them in those positions. Um, they'd enter into illegal wars, for example, on flimsy made of manufactured evidence uh, without, uh, you know, losing a, a night's sleep over it. Um, so you would be, yeah. be broadly in favour of some kind of screening process um, at the highest levels, both in in the corporate space and in in um, in the political space. Okay, um, do you think um, brain scans are? I've heard you speak about this before. Are they? Is that a conceivable, practical option to implement? Well, I've read a lot about brain scans, and there are people like Ken Keel and uh, um, Blair and Fallon, for example, who, who have become expert at, at doing them and identifying the, the psychopathic brain characteristics which show abnormalities in, in the connectivity and, and chemistry between the areas of the brain that, that regulate and process emotions. Uh, and it, it seems to be associated with the orbitofrontal cortex and then going down to the amygdala and the limbic system and these these areas don't activate in psychopaths in the same way as they do in the rest of us. And so there's a clear pattern uh, of non-activation, which which illustrates the psychopathic brain. So, I mean, I, I, I really I, recently I, I published a paper say, um, claiming or saying that probably psychopaths are the only rational people in the world. Because the rest of us make decisions based on emotions and emotional considerations and relationships and things like that. Psychopaths make purely rational decisions um, and in their own self-interest. So that the end, the logical end result of that line of thought is that they would bankrupt the world for an extra dollar for themselves, as I argue happened in the last global financial crisis. Um, as you might know, one of my um, um, most quoted papers uh, is called The Corporate Psychopath's Theory of the Global Financial Crisis, which argues that because of the money and uh, prestige and huge bonuses available in investment banking and corporate banking, it attracts the psychopathic at greater rates than at any other area of the economy. And their greed, and this was the key ingredient of the crisis, their greed causes a uh, financial meltdown for the rest of us. And if it wasn't for global government intervention, 
uh, the world would have been more or less bankrupt, or the, certainly the banking system would have been more or less bankrupt. Um, some people argue that maybe that's what we should have allowed to happen because none of virtually none, apart from in um, um, Iceland, virtually none of the bankers who, who contributed it suffered anything at all for it, whereas the rest of us did. I mean, yeah. England, the UK still hasn't recovered from that event, really, that our, our salaries and our economic um, wealth is still at 2007 or eight levels, I think. Yeah, it, it's difficult, isn't it, for people to punish those they see as part of their tribe? And so you would have the judicial system, judiciary and the politicians and the corporate bankers feeling that they're all part of the same tribe, if you like. And perhaps well, I think, uh, the other th the other part of it, yeah, they, they think they're part of the same elite group or mm. tribe, as you say. But politicians are often enthralled to multimillionaire businessmen because they they want to be like them. They want to. Uh, and so they the the uh, potential of of punishing them or, or or bringing them to court um doesn't doesn't cross their minds i mean what should have happened at the global financial crisis we should have tripled the number of pers personnel in the in the fraud and serious crime squad and let them loose on the bankers that's what should have happened yeah yeah um one of the things that you you've mentioned before, um, um, and I, I, it's good to to touch on it again, is that um, you you came across an, in the financial services space um, an organization or somebody that um, said that they were looking for psychopaths, that they wanted to bring uh, people with psychopathic traits oh, into yeah, the that, organization. That was, uh, I think, it was a journalist called Brian Basham uh, from Memory. Mm. And he was talking about that paper that I just mentioned, the, the global, uh, the, the corporate psychopath theory of the global financial crisis. And he was talking to, about it to a fellow, well, to a banker, a corporate banker friend of his. And they said that they'd used a psychopathy measure to recruit people, not to keep them out. If, if a bank was actually using uh, a psychopathy measure to recruit people, as as, as they said in that um a newspaper article mm. then of course you'd have even more psychopaths if they were good at it anyway uh recruited into the banking system which would then ripple out through uh through the rest of the banks because those people would move jobs and it, it create what it does is when you have those people in charge it creates um a declining morality and the declining ethics in the whole organization mm. um and I suppose one thing I should mention here is, although it's a more or less 1% of the adult population who are what we might call categorical psychopaths, in other words, very high levels of psychopathy, another minority, and it seems to be around 23% 20, of males and maybe 13% uh, of females, are sufficiently psychopathic to... Uh, to be potentially problematic to society. And I would argue that though that minority of people, um, if they're led by a psychopath, then the psychopath allows their psycho their own psychopathy to, th to flourish and blossom in ways that wouldn't normally take place. And then the whole organisation becomes systemically psychopathic in its entirety. Because good people leave, and there's only the psychopathic stay behind, because only they are resilient enough to withstand the torments of their leader. Um, and so you get a, an organisation that's more and more psychopathic. Uh, and I, I'd, I'd quote the, the um, German Nazi Party in the 20th century as a as a good example of that. They've been described by other people as an entirely psychopathic organization. And it, Hitler was diagnosed as a psychopath in 1933, um, Goring in 1946 in the uh, war trials, the Nuremberg war trials, and Hess in 1941 when he flew to Scotland 
to make some kind of deal with the British or attempt to make some kind of deal. And so all three of the top Nazi party members were all psychopathic. Um, and then that allows, so there's no, absolutely no moral checks and balances on any of them. And they all do exactly what they like. And yeah, and it's a disaster for the rest of us. And that goes for organizations as well as political parties, I would argue. The 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 way to deal with this, it it seems apparent to me, is to have we we have spaces in organisations for everything from compliance to equity, diversity, and inclusion, legal marketing, but there doesn't seem to be. Is there a space in organisations now for would you say morality and ethics, a department devoted to civics or ethics? Is that the way forward? Uh... I'm not sure what the way forward is, to be honest. I mean, logically, you would think that HR would provide some checks and balances against these people uh, because it's them to whom people report their bullying and harassment and, and uh, unethical behaviour. Yeah. Uh, and the, the problem with HR dealing with it is that HR increasingly see themselves as not looking after the employees, but rather looking after the organization's aims and objectives as embodied in the senior management team. So in other words, they sign, they 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 um go on the side of the people who are being complained about rather than on the side of employees. And time after time we see um harassed and and bullied employees leaving the organization because they can't get any justice uh, from internal mechanisms like like HR, for example. The other people who come across this behavior more than other sections or more than other departments are, are auditors because they come across it in the form of attempted fraud or fraud um, by, by psychopath or psychopathic people. Uh, and there's a great paper from Denmark about um, that. I can't remember the author off the top of my head, but they um, they reckon that something like 70% of auditors have come across a corporate psychopath, you know, in the course of their duties. So, so it seems to be HR and auditors who come across them most often, um, but HR don't seem to do anything about it, or maybe they can't do anything about it because of their lack of uh, seniority. Um, you you published some, or you, you were in The Guardian recently, you, and you were drawing attention to some research you've done in relation to male versus female psychopathy. What can you tell us about that research? It's um, fascinating. Yeah, it, that's, that story's gone, uh, seems to have gone global. I was interviewed by, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, Science Illustrated this morning about about that. So, it, it, looking into female psychopathy is is not really my focus. But what I have done over the years is I use a self report measure of psychopathy called the Levinson, Levinson self report yeah. scale. Yeah, the primary the primary scale of that. There's two scales, primary and secondary. So I I argue that I I use primary because that coincides more with the type of psychopath you find in organizational settings and it's supposed to embody it's supposed to encompass the key underlying characteristics of psychopathy rather than the violent antisocial behavioral mani manifestations that you find among criminal psychopaths um, uh, so using that scale over uh, the past 10 or more years um i've always noticed that i'm i'm getting more females than I should be getting uh, according to theoretical expectations, you know, expectations from reading the previous literature about how many female psychopaths there are. So I thought that was interesting. At, at the same time of mine, uh, sorry, at the same time as that, I have a, a student, a doctoral student in Australia who's looking specifically into female psychopaths. So I started to read around the literature and found that there's really no substantial evidence to show that 
a ratio of 10 to 1 or 6 to 1 or 5 to 1 is accurate at all. Um, this is because, well, for a start, most psychologists, when they do this research, they don't report on incidence levels. So you never find that information from their paper. Uh, and the other thing is hardly anyone, if at all, has done any random samples of the population, adult population. We, and it's only really from a random sample that you can get an accurate reading of of incidence levels of psychopathy among males and females. So going back to my research, I, I was finding ratios of you know 1.2 to 1 male to female rather than the 4 to 1 or 5 to 1 that I was expecting. And I went back through the data from the last six quantitative projects that I've done and it was the same story all the way down. And so clearly, um, we're getting, we're finding more female primary psychopaths than we ever thought were were there, um, and that has ramifications for uh, spousal abuse um, issues and, and child custody issues, and whether we believe. Uh, female psychopaths, according to the literature I've, I've read, will pose as victims if they think that will get them out of uh, an awkward situation. So if we knew they were psychopathic, then we would know that they were lying about being victims. Uh, and so we'd get a better read on the reality of the situation as, as it was really happening. Um, so it, knowing how many psychopaths there are in society among both men and women is, is important uh, for that reason to to give us a an accurate reading um the other thing is a lot of the measures the especially the early measures of psychopathy because they were conducted among male prisoners who were psychopathic there's very much a bias towards criminality and masculinity um which has confounded the issues around psychopathy uh, and we even now we we fail to disentangle you know what is what is um uh psychopathic and what is criminal so one of the things that you'll read if you read papers about psychopaths one of the first things you'll read is psychopaths are impulsive now criminal psychopaths may well be impulsive but that doesn't mean corporate psychopaths are um, and yet psychologists repeat this like a mantra without really looking at the initial evidence on which it was based, which is studies of largely studies of male criminal psychopaths. So it's no surprise that male criminal psychopaths are impulsive, but the, the, the psychopaths I've studied are very careful, they're very cunning, they're very scheming, and they make detailed Machiavellian long-term plans. It's like being... It's like when you're dealing with them, it's like being in a game of chess where you don't even realise that the game is taking place and you are just a little pawn being moved around the board at, at their whim. Um, so they're not impulsive, the ones I study. Um, and the other, the other thing, you mentioned Machiavellianism a bit earlier. Machiavellianism corresponds and correlates with primary psychopathy uh, to a very high degree. So I think basically... When you read the literature that they're more or less the same person and i think if we identified machiavellians and we gave them a, a brain scan we found they were actually psychopaths um, so a lot of people would disagree with that statement by the way but that is um, a logical i think um, view of the situation as it is it's just that we haven't done brain scans on machiavellians because we think we're talking about different people you think that um, female psychopathy would... So you, you've touched on it. It would express itself differently. They wouldn't have access to, kind of, to the kind of violence, the ability to be violent like males would, for example. So maybe they would express it in their aggression in a different way. Reputation is... Yeah, according to the literature, there are some differences. So that it's more of an emotional, relational aggression. So they'd use things like... Um, ostracizing people from friendship groups social exclusion social exclusion yeah, um, uh, gossiping and spreading rumors about people um they'd use instead of male 
um, both sets of psychopaths are promiscuous, sexually promiscuous, and in in relationships which have no emotional value to them, it's just um, for the thrill of it. Um, so male psychopaths would use um, to 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 do that would use promises of power and promotion uh, and and increased influence to seduce people to seduce women into bed. Women, on the other hand, would tend to use more um, seductive flirtation uh, techniques rather than coercion, if you see what I mean. So mm. um, a lot more subtle. Um, and all all female psychopathy would be much more subtle than male psychopathy. So that's one reason why it's not recognised as much um, as, as being there. And it's another reason um, uh, why we don't pick it up on current measures because current measures are, are designed as i said around criminal male psychopaths whose behavior is very overt and if female behavior is much more subtle and overt uh sorry what's the opposite of overt um anyway you know what I discreet mean. discreet yeah then it's harder to pick up and harder harder to notice and that goes for bullying as well Male psychopaths will bully people quite openly in open offices and shout right, go right to their face and shout at them and yell at them until they they burst into tears. Whereas uh, female bullying would be much more subtle and it would tend to be more invisible. It'd be more one in one, one on one. And therefore, when the male gets reported for bullying, there's more people willing to come forward and say, "Yes, that happened." And that actually, that just brings to mind a, a, a case I was involved in as a as an advisor. So it was in the I won't say who it was. It's in the uniformed services sector, and I was dealing with a junior officer who was complaining about a very much more senior officer who was um, bullying uh, and potentially psychopathic. Uh, and it turned out that when the bull he was reported for bullying, another twenty nine officers came forward with the same uh, with the same view and said yes he bullied me as well. So it was almost like a me too moment. As soon as that senior officer was exposed, everyone came forward and said yeah that's what happened to me. Um, so yeah, so it does it does uh, it does take place in all sectors of the of the uh, economy. If you're in an office or you're working in a corporate environment, you're working with a manager, you're working with a leader, um, you're working with a colleague, and you suspect they may be, you may be working with a psychopath or somebody with psychopathic tendencies, what are the signs to look for? Well, the, the signs to look for in, in a, attempting to identify a female with certain psychopathic traits if people are coming out of meetings in tears uh, on a frequent basis, then you should suspect that there's some form of abuse going on um, in terms of relationships or emotional man manipulation. Um, the other side would be that people start leaving the that part of the organisation in larger numbers than would otherwise take place. And typically, it, the, the staff turnover rate will doubles you know, in a short period of time. Um, and that should be a major reg signal, but it always seems that it's not noticed for some reason, because the, the the psychopathic manager gives a convincing reason to those above them, saying, you know, I run a tight ship, it's a high pressure environment. If I tell them if they can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen, and it sounds plausible. It sounds like they're working towards organisational objectives Goals, yeah. by pressuring people. Um, but actually, it, it's bad for the organisation because good people leave uh, on a on a large scale. Um, so it, it's really the same signs as you, as you look for in a male psychopath, but on a more subtle, understated, and less obvious manner. Mm. So by implication, harder, harder to. Um, to identify what so, what what people have to, to told me mainly women who have told me over the years uh, at my um 
public talks when I've when I've given figures that you know of five to one male to female psychopaths, quite often people will women will come up to me and say, I think you'll find there are more female psychopaths than you're talking about. And it tend I think perhaps the other females are more attuned to psychopathic behavior in the female managers than a man m- might be in the same circumstance. Mm. Um, this is just conjecture, really, but it, it does seem t- more than more than three women have told have said that to me. Have, have said, you know, because relationships are more important to women, if they suffer relational jam- damage or the, the are the victims of rumours, uh, they're more effective, they're more affected by it than than men might be. Um, but also, conversely, more vulnerable to it right so females might be more vulnerable to the relational destruction that could be caused by an abusive psychotic they would feel it more um but yeah you mentioned that one of the the major signs to look for would be abnormal levels of attrition in a particular part of an organization um and you would look for i mean visible signs people coming out of meeting rooms in tears um, emotional signs of emotional distress within the organization that would be kind of be counter to what's generally going on. That would be number yeah, two. Right. Yeah. Anything levels, else? They usually, once you start to investigate, they're creating a lot more damage than uh, first appears, and they're creating the damage at multiple levels simultaneously. So probably a, a good way of trying to um, find concrete information that would allow you to get them dismissed would be to look at their financial transactions and and expense claims and things like that because they'll tend to try and uh, be fraudulent or uh, excessive about their uh, um, claims for uh, that kind of um, compensation. And in the literature... the literature says, uh, uh, not not my own research, just the literature about uh, female psychopaths, they're more likely to commit fraud than male psychopaths. Um, wow, I'm not I'm not entirely convinced of that myself, but it it's a good working hypothesis because fraud is unnoticed and it's subtle and it's manipulative. Um, so men, male psychopaths do commit fraud as well. Uh, but according to the literature, we, women do it even more. Um, the, interesting to uh, investigate that that a bit further. Wow, that is because fraud can be surreptitious. It can be hidden, and for a while, at least, until the auditors track it down. Um, so, financial fraud—that's number three. Um, and yeah, so there's three good ones to look out for. Uh, a paper just came out in the Journal of Business Ethics. Um, mm. And sorry, I can't remember the author's names off the top of my head. But basically, mm. they were arguing that if you need to control this kind of behavior, you have to have an organization where there are very clear rules and regulations that everybody knows about and everybody can see those rules and codes of conduct being enforced. So people know if they do wrong, they will be found out and they will be fired or or reprimanded in some way, um, which is, I understand the theory and I, I probably believe it's true at, at, at some level. Um, but where you have the situation like Enron, mm-hmm. which had a great code of conduct and great rules and regulations of which nobody to pay, paid the slightest Sorry, nobody paid the slightest bit of attention to to their code, or almost nobody in Enron, to their code of conduct. And so um, there was no enforcement, and there were, and there was no rules because right at the top, people could think could see that an ethical and immoral and bullying and abuse was going on, and that just filtered the whole way down the organisation. So the pr- the premise of their argument is probably that you need good decent, caring leadership in order to uh, keep potentially problematic employees under control. But if you don't have that, 
leadership, then obviously it, it's um, an impossible task because it, everything, the tone and the culture and the behaviour of an organisation very much depend on the leadership. And if the leadership itself is immoral and unethical, then that filters down the whole of the of the hierarchy. That's really fascinating. Um, what 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 the implication there is that HR departments and senior leadership need to search for and identify management potential managers with empathetic qualities. Right. Yeah, yeah. They've, they've what got we need there. in society and in organisations mm. is people who care, because otherwise, this crisis of sustainability that we're facing as a species is not going to get any better. We, we need people at the top who care about the future, who care about the environment, and don't care about um, making a bigger bonus for an extra few dollars based on dis releasing toxic waste, for example, into rivers and, and uh, the earth. Mm. And that's what we've got at the moment. There's a great paper um, which directly relates the, the uh, willingness of people to release toxic waste illegally and the level of psychopathy, and there's a direct correlation between the two, because psychopaths don't care about the environment or the future, or the people who will live in the future, and so for them it's a no-brainer. It's a a short-term profit for long-term destruction. It sounds to me from from listening to you today, the problem is that the the acceleration and the promotion of the people with the psychopathic qualities and trait characteristics. They seem to be able to jump ahead of people with empathetic and caring and um, community-based morals and altruistic goals and stuff. They seem to have the jump on those people. And until we address that in society and in the corporate space, um, it will just continue or maybe even hasten. Um, last question, Clive. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So I think it is hastening. Because because of the rapid turnover of personnel in organisations, we're increasingly relying on shallow and superficial selection methods, where the person who shines the bright, the most brightly is the person who's ruthless, who's prepared to lie about their achievements, is prepared to claim qualifications they don't have, is is prepared to claim the good work of others that they haven't really done, mm -hmm. um, and doesn't get emotional and flustered and 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 bothered by the interview and therefore they look like star performers uh, and we don't properly investigate their CVs we don't talk to the people who used to work for them and, and we end up with more and more psychopathic leaders who are giving this false mask of uh, efficiency and and productivity which is just uh, untrue so we've got to be better as a society and organizations we've got to be get better at at choosing leaders. It's as simple and, as that. Yeah, and organizations, like you said at the start, have got to understand that there is a financial and, or, uh, and existential risk if you don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Dr. Clive Body, thank you so much. That was, that was endlessly fascinating. And uh, yeah, um, kind of, it, it, it's a harbinger of doom in a way, in that, um, you know... <laughs> We we do have to, as a society, address everything that you said. But yeah, I think it's very important that we keep talking about it and discussing these ideas. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. I sometimes, by the way, I sometimes start my public lectures by saying uh, the good news is that most of us are good people who care about the future. And now for the bad news. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a tendency, you know, you, you can become a bit over cynical when you're researching these people. Mm -hmm.